It all began when a couple of very bright and charming, extremely liberal octogenarians asked me to join the Society to Restore Robert Newton Baskin's Reputation. They said they were asking me because they needed some younger blood. <laughs> wow, you don't get that kind of comment very often. With that kind of flattery, of course, I said yes, but I said yes before inquiring, who is Robert Baskin, excuse me, Robert Newton Baskin, who is he? And they said, he was the most hated man in Utah. <laughs> wow. When he was buried in 1918 in Mount Olivet Cemetery, he was denied a headstone marking his grave. The newly formed Society for Baskin aimed to raise enough money to give him his due, a headstone and some recognition. Baskin served as Salt Lake City's mayor in 1892 and got reelected in 1894. He is hailed quite often as the father of modern Utah. And he also served in the Utah legislature and became Chief Justice of the Utah Supreme Court. Now as I continue to learn more and more about Baskin and the reasons why he was so despised, the more I wanted to research what the Utah Territory was like in 1891 when 127 charter members established the first Unitarian Church in Salt Lake City. My hunch is that all 127 members voted for Baskin just one year after founding this church. Baskin ran for mayor on the Liberal Party ticket, which was founded in 1870 to oppose the LDS Church's domination of local politics. I want to be really clear. My intent this morning is not to reignite the, the bitter relationship that existed between Mormons and non-Mormons in the latter part of the 19th century. But the history of this church would lose a, a key historical perspective if we didn't place its beginnings in the context of a rather caustic relationship between Mormons and non-Mormons at that time. Fortunately, we find ourselves today in a far more civil society, a far cry from the acrimonious and actually spiteful political and religious landscape that permeated the latter part of, this, of, of the 19th century, right here in Salt Lake and the Utah Territory. Newcomers to this church are always amazed to learn that the Denver Unitarian minister, Samuel Atkins Elliott was able to deliver two speeches on liberal religion, December 1890. Delivered those speeches right here in Salt Lake City, and it's just amazing that 127 of the listeners found the, the courage and the inspiration to begin a Unitarian church two months later, February 24th, 1891. By better understanding the, the difficult circumstances of living in an unrelenting theocracy, I think we'll come to see both the, the necessity of having a liberal church as well as a special appreciation for what our forebears had to navigate in order to form a liberal congregation. For example, the expertise of this church's first minister, David Utter, entailed a scholarly approach to biblical criticism. Can you imagine biblical criticism in, this, in, 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 this, in the Salt Lake Valley, 1891? It's not what the saints had hoped for as the new, new church began to exercise its, its muscle. In trying to place the origins of this church into some historical context, I want to assume although no raw material exists, but it's pretty safe to assume that the age of the charter members would, 
would probably put them in their 40s and 50s. That would mean that the average member would have been born somewhere between 1841 and 1851. We have no raw data as to how, how many members of that, at that time were either apostates or Jack Mormons, but there were probably quite a few. I wouldn't be at all surprised if far more than half of the new congregation were at some point connected with the LDS Church. I was shocked when it dawned on me that this church came into existence a mere 14 years after the death of Brigham Young. That's not much time. And furthermore, most everyone who began this new fledgling liberal church was at least in their teenage years at the time of the Civil War. So they, they come with a whole lot of history to 1891 to form this church. I mean, they, they were front and center in a lot of uh, difficult periods of our, our nation's history. Many in that first congregation would also have been old enough to remember at least hearing about, and it depended, of course, on their age, but most of them knew about the Mountain Meadows Massacre in 1857. And this was perhaps the most shameful example of Brigham Young's powerful grip on all Mormons in the Utah Territory at that time. He arranged for the cold-blooded murder of about 140 men, women, and children who were making their way through southern Utah en route to California. Brigham Young's role in the massacre had been obscured for a long time, with John D. Lee of the Mormon militia becoming the scapegoat of that tragic episode. Now, when Brigham Young led the first Mormons into the vastness of, of the Great Basin, his aim was to found a new nation. Now, the only problem was that he intended to found the new nation on land already possessed by the United States following its war with Mexico. And so a territory named Utah was imposed on them in 1850. By 1857, President James Buchanan declared the Mormons to be in rebellion and the cause of what the president termed America's first civil war. He sent 30% of the entire US Army towards Utah in order to restore order and to instill a replacement for the acting governor, Brigham Young. Well, evidently, Buchanan did not have enough advanced intelligence to know that nobody was going to replace Brigham Young. <laughs> Brigham Young mounted an armed resistance against the US troops and destroyed an immense amount of government property. And Young saw in this armed conflict the initiation of the end of times, the final war of good against evil that would end in the dominance of God's kingdom ruled by the men of the Mormon priesthood. Now, although this conflict between Utah and the United States proved somewhat shy of Armageddon, the kind of religious fervor expressed at that time reveals the, the, the zealous nature among the early Mormon pioneers. Utah was going to be ground zero for Christ's return, and the LDS faith would triumph over all the earth. When you look back, you realize that, that Utah was mostly insulated from the Civil War, and I mean now the, the official Civil War starting in 1861, Utah was remote, and its unique culture, doctrine, prophecy, served them well to kind of establish an, an isolated entity, kind of a very separate piece of, of land. Brigham Young rejoiced when Lincoln was desperate for soldiers, and the Mormon leader interpreted this stage of the Civil War as a time when the North and South had begun to, and I'll quote, empty the earth, cleanse the land, and prepare the way for the return of the Latter-day Saints to be the center stake of Zion. Mormons considered the Civil War deserved punishment by God 
for the persecution heaped on them from the governments of Ohio, Missouri, and Illinois. Brigham Young's rhetoric was clear and to the point. The nation, he said, the nation that has slain the prophet Joseph Smith will be broken to pieces like a potter's vessel. Yes, worse, they will be ground to powder. The Civil War represented the great apocalyptic vision that both sides would destroy each other and that Mormons, under God's revelation and through his restored priesthood, would reign. There was also perhaps a self-serving spirit in the Mormon proclamation that war widows would be welcomed into plural marriages. <laughs> Did they say that with a straight face? I don't know. <laughs> so it was, it was into this ferociously righteous fervor gripping the Utah Territory that Robert Newton Baskin entered Utah in 1865. Brigham Young's perpetual visions of greatness and redemption for all their trials and persecutions dominated the culture here. Baskin was only one of about 300 non-Mormons throughout the Utah Territory, estimated to be about 70,000 in population. Baskin hailed from Ohio en route to California. He was intent on, on making it to California to prosper in the mining business, but found the mines here in Little Cottonwood Canyon just as tantalizing. He went to Harvard Law School for a year, which seemed to suffice for his law credentials. He never graduated law school, but as a skillful orator, nobody challenged him. Now, one of the first things he did was get involved in the legal disputes surrounding the Mountain Meadows Massacre, in which Baskin set out to prove that Lee was merely a scapegoat and that Brigham Young called all, all the shots. This did not exactly endear him to the Latter-day Saints. Baskin, outraged by what was known as the twin evils, theocracy and polygamy, Bastion became the leader in the campaign to unseat Mormons representing the Utah Territory in Washington, D.C. It was actually a miracle that Baskin was not assassinated because Utah in the 1850s, 60s, and 70s was about as violent a society as found anywhere in the world. Anyone who differed from Brigham Young was considered to be obstructing God's plan. And they were either beaten and castrated. And castration was a popular form of um, getting rid of non-Mormons. So they were either beaten, castrated, or shot dead in cold blood with full impunity. The territory was essentially lawless. Bishops wielded a lot of power at that time. Bishop Edwin Woolley, who exhorted his 13th ward members to deadly violence. Our streets, he said, are now filled with whores, thieves, gamblers, and pimps. The only way to purify it is to drive them out, tear down their houses, and send them away so they would not come again, and God will be with us. We will clean, purify, and wash the 13th ward of all damnable sinners. So you may wonder, where did the non-Mormons hang out? <laughs> Intentionally excluded from brotherly ties with Mormon groups, non-Mormon men sought camaraderie in fraternal organizations like the Odd Fellows, they were here at their time, the Caledonia Club, the Irish American Society, but the most influential of these societies was the free and accepted Masons with whom Baskin associated. Later on, in 1883, the founding of the Alta Club served the purpose of providing a really nice gathering place for non-Mormons. 1866, the Grand Master of the Masonic Lodge in Salt Lake City issued an edict that barred Mormons from becoming members. This edict 
was not rescinded until 1984. The committee meetings I attended for the Society to Restore Robert Newton Baskin's good name were held in the Masonic Temple. My historic sensibilities were just tingling with excitement. Wow. <laughs> I'm here at the scene. The men, of course it was the men, the men working against polygamy and against the church control of government were dedicated Masonic brothers. And eventually the time came when it was necessary to, to move from mere ideology into hardcore politics. The Liberal Party was then formed in 1870 to oppose the LDS Church. William Godby took the helm. He was a Mormon when he founded a journal in 1868 called Utah Magazine. It challenged the LDS policy set forth by Brigham Young. Godby and his team called Godbyites were excommunicated the next year in 1869. The progression goes on. So the Liberal Party was then formed in 1870. Mormons had until that time elected candidates who ran unopposed. But this would now be a new era when the Liberal Party presented a slate of candidates. The Mormons countered by forming the People's Party a platform from which LDS candidates ran for office. Now, as you can well understand, the Liberal Party at that time didn't win many elections. There were a few in some, some mining towns and also in Tooele County, the only county at that time with a non-Mormon majority. Godby's Utah Magazine became the Mormon Weekly Tribune. And in 1873, Three anti-Mormon newcomers from Kansas bought it, and it became the Salt Lake Tribune, <laughs> 1873. National outrage against polygamy benefited the Liberal Party in Utah. In 1892, the Anti-Polygamy Edmonds Act became law. An even stronger act came into being in 1887. That one required candidates and voters to submit to an anti-polygamy oath. Enforcement of these bills put a significant number of latter-day polygamists in federal prisons, including the one built in Salt Lake's Sugar House area specifically for that purpose. The Liberal Party then swept the city government of Ogden in 1889 and took Salt Lake City in 1890, George M. Scott became the first non-Mormon mayor just a few months before the establishment of the First Unitarian Church. Baskin then became Salt Lake's mayor in 1892. Baskin immediately went to work on modernizing Salt Lake's infrastructure he installed all new water and sewage lines, paved the streets, and began building the city county building, whose edifice Baskin sought to rival the Mormon temple. <laughs> wow. By the way, 1891, when this church was founded, was also the time when the angel Moroni was put on the spire of the Mormon temple. And I'm sure many of you know the architect was a Unitarian. That's a whole, that's a whole other, other story. <laughs> Mayor Baskin also assumed the presidency of the Board of Education. At that time, you can imagine, only 27% of Salt Lake's youth attended school. 27%. The Mormons were not advocates of free public schools because of their belief in self-sufficiency. And they also believed that the textbooks contained infidelity towards God. Baskin struggled hard on behalf of public education. So it's not difficult to imagine the, well, the significance of a Unitarian church in Salt Lake City in 1891. The Liberal Party had just scored a huge victory that was before they had cell phones in 1890. 
The Liberal Party had just scored a huge victory. The Salt Lake Tribune was humming along as the voice for the Liberal Party. And I'm sure that many of our Unitarian forebears held membership in the Alta Club. But there was a need for something more. A religious institution that honored liberal values and also offered a moral framework from which those values could begin to be implemented. Today, 124 years following the founding of this church, we enjoy a diverse community, good relations with the LDS leadership, the Alta Club, which now allows women to become members, a struggling Salt Lake Tribune, no more private clubs, a thriving downtown, and, this is how it all started, a headstone for the grave of Robert Newton Baskin, <laughs> right here in Mount Olivet. There is still a, a tremendous need for a flourishing liberal religious voice. Utah is not as inclusive as it needs to be, and the values of self-sufficiency still linger and permeate the state, perpetuating tremendous hardship for the poor. Our progressive values must continue to exert its influence in this environment in order to assure a democratic process, anti-discrimination laws, and leadership in dealing with the pressing issues of our time. Of course, every era faces its own unique challenges. And we know well the challenges of our time and how urgent it is for us to actually to grow stronger, sit at the table, and contribute as best we can the ideals and the values that, that we hold so, so very dear to our heart. And so the need for this church continues to, to be so, so strong. And it is up to us, to all of us, to make sure that we do continue into the future, carrying a distinctive voice that will help the progressive values shape this city, this valley, and hopefully the state.